So Celeste wanted me to discuss binary stars, how do they form, where a star orbits another star. Well, of course, uh, when referencing stars, we're talking about the young ones that are really big and hot. So you'd have the sun right here, and here's Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, or I would like to say Alpha and Bravo. And you have Proxima Centauri. Uh, these two are orbiting each other. These are binary stars right here. When the astronomers call them a uh, binary system, because they're orbiting each other, they say it's Alpha Centauri um, AB, so big A and big B. Because when you look through a telescope that doesn't have very high resolution, uh, it looks like one star. But when you get a really advanced telescope, like the 3.6 meter telescope, in Chile, in the mountains up there, really, really high up in the mountains, you can take a picture of those bad boys, and this is what they look like. This distance right here is about the distance from the sun to, uh, to I believe it was, what was it Uranus or Neptune? I can't remember. But basically, it takes them about 80 years to orbit each other. 80 years to orbit each other, that's a long time. So it's a... Uh, it's a dual orbit, so they both orbit each other. It isn't like um, the Earth and the Sun, where the Earth goes mostly in a, in a circular configuration. They more or less have like a dual elliptical uh, orbit with each other, which is really cool. Then you have Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the uh, little red one down here. Very small, tiny little red one. And that one's over here. That's what it looks like. And it's a bit distant from Alpha Centauri AB. Of course, it's in the southern sky, so we can't see it up here in the United States. So this is what it would look like. There's a southern cross, and then you have Proxima Centauri AB, and then you have Proxima, or no, Alpha Centauri AB, and then you have Proxima up there. So these are really, really, really close, though. Remember, they're about four, between four and five light years from us which is extremely close in terms of uh, the galaxy, because the galaxy, remember, is about 100,000 light years in diameter. Uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenally huge. <clears throat> but their formation, why should these objects be orbiting around each other? Especially since um, you would need a third body and the third body isn't necessarily there, per se. But I mean, you could say, well, Proxima Centauri was that third body that allowed for the angular momentum transfer, and then Proxima Centauri got ejected out, and it just left alpha, the two alphas uh, orbiting each other in, uh, in a binary system. But what I think possibly happened is that they formed near each other when they were born, and they just stayed in orbit around each other. But I don't necessarily believe that. I think they're wildly different in age, probably at least at least 50 to 60, maybe even 100 million years difference in age. Um, and the, the only reason, reason why I say this is because um, Alpha Centauri A is a bit younger and brighter than the sun, so the sun would be like right here and Alpha Centauri A would move up the diagram a little bit, and Alpha Centauri B would be a little bit lower than the sun, so it would be a little bit older than the sun. So to say these objects um, orbited around each other the entire time ever since they were born wouldn't make any sense because they're different ages. One would clearly have been around for much longer than the other. So what I'm considering is there was probably a lot more stars in either of those other two stars' vicinity, which was subsequently ejected out to uh, to make sure the three-body problem was satis was satisfied for you know the angular momentum transfer, because the idea what I'm saying is the idea of a single star moving through the galaxy and then capturing another st star of equal mass is highly improbable. They'll just fly right past each other, but if you have two stars two very large stars orbiting each other and another star comes in the vicinity. Now say for instance, there is another, there was another star, there was an A, B and a C. So we'll just say there's an A and a C 
all, both orbiting each other, and they're born together at the same age. They'd be moving through the galaxy orbiting each other, and then they would interact with the bee. The bee would transfer angular momentum, toss the C out, and then the A and B would then continue orbiting each other in that elliptical fashion. That's why those two stars are uh, much different in age. Um, Proxima Centauri is really distant from really distant from both both the two uh, Alpha Centauri's. Um, no, that's the Sun. The two Alpha Centauri's, Proxima Centauri's, way down here. This star, uh, I have it as around. It's possibly I don't remember if I have its exact age down, but more than likely around 220 to 240 million years old. Uh, Proxima Centauri is about, about here. It's a basically a pre-brown dwarf. It's going to continue losing mass and it's going to stop shining uh, within the next 120, 150 million years. So we're not going to see that happen. But Proxima Centauri also has a uh, an Earth-sized object orbiting it uh, in the uh, so-called habitable zone, like what the Earth is around the Sun. So that's really cool. Uh, maybe we can aim our telescopes at it and see if there's anything uh, going on over there. <laughs> Should be kind of interesting. Tell the SETI people to go look in that direction. Um, <clears throat> anyways, to answer the question, how those, how this, how binary systems form, I would suppose that the binary systems that form, the stars that orbit each other now, um, in order for them to have formed around each other in their current configuration, they would need to be very similar in age to show that, that that's what's happened. It wouldn't make any sense for a binary system to be there and then the two objects be very different in age. Um, hypothetically, the Sun and Mercury. I have Mercury's being trillions of years old, 7 trillion to 21 trillion years old, possibly older, 32 trillion even. Uh, Mercury is a very long dead old star. It's completely solidified its interior and it's been orbiting around the galaxy for hundreds of billions of years. Of course, that's impossible to the astronomers, but um, anyways, what I mean is with Mercury orbiting the sun as it is now, the sun could have easily captured uh, Mercury because it has a lot of mass there, um, which means it didn't need a third uh, another body to 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 transfer the angular momentum. You could just say, "Huh, come here, Mercury. You're you're, you're mine now." But um, if it, if Mercury was the size and mass and had the angular momentum of the sun close to the sun, it, it would need a third body. It would need need to throw something out to satisfy that third third body problem, which is kind of weird to think about because everything can get much more complex especially when you have multiple objects orbiting multiple objects. I was talking to Celeste about this and it's like binary systems, they can be really close together or really far apart, but then you can have a tertiary system. So you have a binary system and then you have another star. Okay, you have two, two stars orbiting each other and you have a third star orbiting that system. And then you could have a quad system where you have two stars orbiting each other, two stars orbiting each other, and they all orbit together in a, in a big, in a big uh, stellar family. And then you could also have even more complex arrangements where you have those, that, those quad systems and then you have Earth-sized objects or Jupiter-sized objects orbiting uh, that system and then the other binary system is over here spinning and then it forms like that. So you have all these different wild arrangements of star systems and all of them absolutely disprove the nebula hypothesis, but astronomers don't, don't like to talk about that. They don't like to say, well, how, how did all these random systems form? How does all this occur? Because the nebula hypothesis says that all the stars and star systems should form with one single object and then form a flattened disk and then the planets form out of that, which is uh, basically 18th century um, um, outdated uh, conjecture because in this theory what happens is is the uh, the young stars as they cool and die they become the planets so given they exchange orbits on a regular basis from wandering in the galaxy with other stars you can mix everything up like a giant blender 
That's basically what a galaxy is. It's a giant blender of stars that are all exchanging orbits. They're all tossing new star or tossing old stars out, adopting new stars, exchanging orbits all the time. Of course, this is over uh, a period of hundreds of millions of years. It just doesn't happen, you know, o overnight. I mean, sure, maybe some objects can be adopted or slam into each other, you know, in no time flat. But for the most part, a lot of the systems are very stable, like our system. Um, <clears throat> and that being said, let's see what else did I want to discuss here. Yeah, the the last thing the last thing I want to discuss here is Celeste also uh, gave me an idea for rationalizing why a white dwarf would be the very beginning stages because of Sirius A and Sirius B. Uh, Sirius A is a large blue giant star and Sirius B is a white dwarf. Now what the astronomers are saying is all the stars, if they're, if they're big and large like that, then they probably had to form together at the same time. So naturally in this theory, what I have is white dwarfs being very young stars right in the very beginning of, of stellar birth. So naturally we should find a lot more of these white dwarfs orbiting um, blue giants or much hotter white stars because they're all young, all young together. So that would put them much closer in age to one another. Uh, and then we can possibly determine how fast the white dwarf would be expanding outwards to its full blue giant stage. But of course that's, that's conjecture on my part. But I, the reason why I have white dwarfs as being very young is because they're extremely hot and they're extremely dense. Uh, astronomers, they think that white dwarfs are dead stars. They're not. They're, they're very, very, very energetic and very, very, very young in, in, in this theory. The dead stars uh, that have cooled and collapsed upon themselves, they form rocky material in their centers and they age considerably and they gravitationally collapse and they form things like um, oceans and life and girlfriends and stuff like that. <laughs> All right, uh, I think that sums up this talk. And also link a video, I remember Celeste also asking me that, um, was there a video made that I made in the past that sort of reviewed um, an I the idea of, you know, how binary systems form? Because a lot of binary systems are not actually both shining stars, if you think about it. In this theory, all the stars, the majority of the stars no longer shine. So a binary system could be a Jupiter-sized object orbiting really close, or orbiting, if, if you will, a sun-like object. So you can even, if you want to go as far as mention the binary system of Jupiter and the sun, because that is a binary system. We already have a binary system. But it isn't that simple because you actually have a lot of other stars that are in various stages of their evolution, all orbiting the sun. Um, and also dead stellar remains. But uh, anyways, I'll link this. There's a principle of stellar co-evolution paper and a video that sort of kind of explains it a little bit and where astronomers went wrong, how they were, you know, taking their observations and they were jumping, jumping to conclusions before they had all the observations and they needed to make an accurate analysis of, of, of what they were seeing uh, done. But what I mean by that is astronomers back in the day, they, weren't, they were only looking at the stars that shined. They, they went like this. They said, these, these are the all stars that shine, and they developed entire models that try to make these all like an Ouroboros, like where they would die, explode, collapse, and they would never really evolve. They would just stay up here. But as time went on and we started to get better and better, better telescopes, we could start to see the really, really dim ones. And now we're in 20, 2020, so we can find the objects that don't shine at all through the you know transit method. And those are the most evolved stars, but astronomers, they sort of, they don't, they don't look at it like that. They still call them planets it's because they've been trained to believe that the planets and stars are, are something different. They're not. The planet is a highly evolved star. But, um, <clears throat> all right, you guys, uh, hope you liked that video, Celeste. I tried my best to explain it. 
Alright guys, take it easy.